I'm Jason Peacock, and I am excited to be talking about Mythic Battles Pantheon, a game I have been waiting just over a year to show up on my door. I was in love with Monolith's first game, Conan. When I looked at what they were doing with this skirmish game, with the special powers and uh, and uh, the miniatures of gods and titans fighting monsters and heroes of Greek legend, I was through the roof excited to get my hands on this. So, was it worth the hype after all this time? Let's open it up and find out. So the minis look great, but let me spruce them up. It'll take me about half an hour, two seconds, video time, and I'll make them pop a bit and we'll set it up. So there's almost two games in one here. There is the pre-draft, where you are taking turns drafting your army. And then there's the game, where you take your said army and you battle the other person. I just use the, the first two armies that my wife and I draft against each other. Now before I get into this, you might be wondering, why am I reviewing a game that you could only get on Kickstarter? And you would be right to ask that. The only reason I'm really taking the time to do this is because it's getting a Kickstarter relaunch confirmed by Monolith. So this will be going back to Kickstarter uh, sometime in the spring or fall. After their Batman and before their um, Mythic Battles Ragnarok coming in 2019 and some new Conan expansions also coming in 19 so there is a chance to get your hands on this on the next kickstarter so that's why i'm talking about it and there's no point in just talking about the uh the core box because it's all kickstarter exclusive and it's not going retail there is a possibility in the future that monolith will be selling it from a web store but that is not a, um confirmed as of yet so that's out of the way, let's get into it. We're going to assume that we've already drafted and we've already put uh, some of our dudes on the map. In a typical skirmish game, everybody starts off the map. Now this is a crazy looking miniatures game, but it's also very much a card game. Every unit is going to have a certain amount of cards in your deck. Your Gonna have a hand of six cards to start. And if you want to activate a unit, you've gotta have that card in your hand. If you don't have that card in the hand, there's a couple things you can do, which I'll explain in a second. Generally, the first time you play a card, say I, I don't have these uh, Amazons on the board yet. This is a troop. They're the only ones represented by more than one unit. And I play the Amazon card, then their first activation would be getting put in the board on my deploy zone, which would be outlined in the scenario. Generally, like if I'm the blue, anything touching my edge of the board is a deploy zone, and the opposite end would be the same for that. Now, there, there's a lot of rules, I suppose, in this game, but it's also a very simple game. Phases in a turn starts off with a player having to either activate, play a card and activate a unit, or passing. Well, the first thing they would do on their turn is draw a card. Now, here's my hand of six cards, say. You always start uh, the game with three Art of War cards. These cards are used for a number of different things. Um, a lot of your heroes and monsters have special powers, and they would require Art of War cards to work. For example, Poseidon here... He's got a trident power. 
He can make uh, an X dice plus one range attack on three different areas, like area effects. So he's going to hit every unit in those three zones. The X refers to where his special power stat is currently at. Right now at full health, he's uh, at a seven. So that X would mean seven dice he's going to roll. As he gets hurt, the stat clips slide down and their stats get worse and worse. So the more beat up they get, the more they uh, reflect that in their uh, attributes. So I draw a card. I can pass and draw a second card. Or I can play a unit card. So I'm going to play my Poseidon. I can do two of three simple actions. You can't do the same one. So I can walk whatever his move stat is. So say I move into here. Spaces have a number on them. And that's how many different units can fit in there. Uh, a troop for... Figures is one unit. Uh, then I can do an attack. That's a simple action. Um, you can't do an attack and then move because, and I quote, this isn't a game of cowards. So um, even though you can do two of the three simple actions um, in any order, you can't attack after you do a move action. The other thing you can do is to pick up one of these Omphala stones. It's one of the two ways to win. Your god is going to absorb four of these. Now that could vary based on the scenario or skirmish setup, but typically four of them. Or you can kill the enemy's deity. Each team has one deity, which is a god or a titan, which make these guys look small. The other thing a figure can do is a complex action. A complex action would be... Um, and only your deity can do it, absorbing one of these stones, which is uh, their full action. And um, when you do that, you also get to take one of these um, phallus cards, which doubles up. It acts just like an Art of War card, but it gives you the extra advantage to remove it from the game and heal your deity by one, one uh, health. Another complex action could be to run which lets you move your base movement plus one square. And the third complex action is just putting them on the board. So Poseidon was out here, and I played my Poseidon card. Putting him down is a complex action. Once that's done, you activate a dude. You have the option of activating one more. You have to play an Art of War card if you want to do that. I play my Art of War card, and then I would need another troop. You can't activate the same dude twice. So, hey, I got a bull card in my hand, so I'm going to move my bull here, right over here. I'm going to move in and attack these tentacles. Now, you're looking at this game, and you would guess that attacking is a big part of that game, and you would be right. And the attacking actually offers a fairly unique uh, set of choices when you're doing combat. Let me explain. Every unit's going to have a value in sword, which gets worse and worse as they get beat up. Uh, let's say something is attacking with uh, six dice. Um, let's use a real example here. Prometheus is going to attack... He's going to attack Poseidon here, okay? He's got a range of one, so he's going to hit uh, Poseidon. He rolls eight dice for an attack. Poseidon has a shield value of nine. That means I need nine on a six-sided dice with a blank side and the numbers one to five. An attack is made in two assaults if, now if the uh, the number is less than, uh, than six, if it's five or under, there's only one assault ever made, all right? So I need target numbers nine. So I'll roll my dice here, all right? Blanks are immediately removed. They're a lost number. Fives can get set aside because they get re-rolled like a burst and you add whatever you re-roll onto that five. The other numbers can be uh, used to add one to any other dice, okay? It doesn't matter. If I wanted to re remove this three, I can change this two to a three if I want to. If I want to remove these two ones, I can change this three up to a five. So you're moving dice to add numbers. Now, 
when I'm talking about having interesting choices, right? Uh, let's say I've got this. Now, I could re-roll that 5 to get a 9, or I can straight up remove all 4 of these to add 4 to this 5, making it a 9, which means I don't have to re-roll it. So that would be one hit. Say I did that. I'm going to remove 4 dice, and each one of those dice I remove is going to add one number to this 5. Then, whatever 5s you have left, whether they're rolled naturally or increased to a 5, they're going to get re-rolled and that number is going to add on. So the risk of re-rolling is that if you roll a blank, that's gone. Now, you can also save some of your dice. Just say I didn't remove those four dice to add four to that five. I could save these for the second roll, and if I had have rolled a five and then re-rolled a three, use one of my dice left over from the first roll and add one to that, making it a nine. It's definitely different and unique, and it might be confusing at first, but the rulebook has lots of great examples. It doesn't take long before um, the combat is going along fluidly. So that is the, the gist of the basic mechanics, right? Um, they can have range. They don't necessarily have to be in melee. There's uh, terrain, the trees, the, uh, the pillars, the rocks... They all mean something too, and the game gives us a double-sided player aid. It explains all the different types of terrain, and there's a lot. There's a lot of different kinds of boards. There's water. There's slope. There's cliffs. There's uh, like ten different kinds of terrains. The real meat and potatoes of the game takes that simple concept I just explained, and then you take the vast amount of options that they all have different powers on their card now there's probably close to 200 different gods monsters heroes troops that are available um with the all-in typhon pledge even take away half that even just the core game itself there's a ton of variety in that there's four gods um, four monsters, um, a bunch of heroes. I, I don't even want to start quoting exact numbers because I am not sure. But there is a great amount of variety in the base set. If this is a game you're going to play occasionally, it is well, well worth it. But if you suffer from acquisition disorder and you just want as much variety as possible, even though you know you're not even going to get your big toe wet with a different amount of options, then uh, the Typhon Pledge will make you happy but that being said the the meta of the, the 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 draft where you're trying to pick powers that make your guys synergize and work together is the beauty of this game finding those combos and pulling them off it's almost like having a good combination in a magic deck and all of that variety i still haven't seen a power that duplicates so all of these monsters have their own unique thematic powers right like uh, Scalia here she controls all these tentacles she can just keep like moving her tentacles up and attacking with them and uh, she can respawn them uh, Poseidon's got a crazy trident attack and uh, uh, he can create a storm where he, every turn he can um, he can move units within a certain range, like uh, towards them or further away. Um, the eagle here is awesome. Uh, when he attacks non-flying creatures, he can reroll blanks on a dice on the first roll. And uh, non-flying units cannot retaliate. Retaliating is something I didn't get into. It requires an Art of War card after you get attacked. And then you play the card of the unit that wants to retaliate. And then you get to immediately follow up with an attack on your opponent's turn. So beyond beyond playing an Art of War card for a second activation and retaliating, there you and and special powers, right? Like the more powerful the ability, the more Art of War cards. Zeus has a power that uses three Art of War cards, but he hits his space and everything around him for tons of damage, like everything in those spaces. So if you could pull that off, it's crazy.
I still haven't pulled it off with Zeus. I just, I played one game with him, and all I wanted to do is get into a position where I can pull that off. I didn't succeed, but it was super fun trying. The other things you can do with the maneuver is, um, on any player's turn, okay, every maneuver can be done once per turn per player. On any player's turn, you can play an Art of War, go through your deck, and grab any card you want. On your own turn, um, you can do that, but that's the only maneuver you can do on other people's turns other than retaliating and attacking back. But um, you can play an Art of War card, draw two cards off the top of your deck. You can uh, play a War card if you have a flying and it's called evading. They basically fly up into the air and then that guy that attacked you has to pick another target in range. And if, he, if there's nobody else in range, his attack is wasted. Like I said, this is a card game very much at its heart. This, this is going to make you think it's a miniatures skirmish game, which it is. But it's really primarily a card game, in my opinion. Just like Blood Rage, it looks like a territory control game, which it is. It's a dudes on a map game, but it's primarily a drafting game. That's where the strategy comes from. Let's get into what I'm what I think about this game. Okay, miniatures, amazing. Of course, we'll move on. So my favorite things about the game is how every power is unique and using those powers to uh, get an edge on your opponent is the most rewarding thing for me about the game. The versatility of the deck and the Art of War cards is phenomenal. Everyone gets three Art of War cards at the start of the game. But some of your monsters and your deity and your heroes can also give you additional Art of War cards. So that's, you know, that could be a strategy. You can just want a ton of Art of War cards in your deck, so you're picking guys based on that. And when the deck runs out, an interesting thing happens. The game just pauses. Every other player who didn't just finish their deck takes the rest of their deck into their hand. Then they draw, shuffle up their discard pile, draw an additional three. This goes for the guy that emptied his deck as well. And then play resumes and the player that emptied his deck would pick up any additional cards uh, that he might have been going to do. So the card play, I like. The, the aesthetics and the theme, that's what brought me into this game. The, the, the thought of having a game that was good, to just pick your gods, pick your heroes, your troops, and have them battle it out in um, skirmish style war, is what hooked me. And it delivers. This is the perfect skirmish game for this kind of theme. They they did just what I wanted them to. When I read the rulebook during the Kickstarter, I was hoping it played as good as it read, and it did. But I just, I like the versatility of the deck. I like the options you have with your Art of War. Do you hold on to those cards for a power, or do you use them to get the cards you want? Try and cycle your deck faster. Talents are all the, the abilities over on the right side of the card. Everybody's also got talents, which, unlike the powers, these aren't unique. There's um, there's 17 different talents that um, some units have and some don't. Like, uh, a lot of the big guys would have Mighty Throw. Y depending on the amount of blanks you got on your first roll, you might be able to toss a guy into an adjacent square. This can be really handy, especially when... People are going for the um, Fallis wins. The, the nice touch about a game like this is when they give you player aid cards. Because you know what that tells me? That tells me that the designers love this game. And they want to do everything they can to help you over the biggest obstacle to learning the game. Which is the rules. This tells you all of your options on a game turn. Everything you can do with an Art of War card, what the different symbols mean, um, whether if you're flying, fireproof, or aquatic, what your bonuses are. On the other side of the player aid card, all the different talents, and then what all the different terrains do. That is a nice touch, and I appreciate when a company does that, and I think a lot of other people do too. Um, the rulebook, I found the rulebook was good. There's even a quick start action where it's like, you use these guys, you use these guys. Um, they've got simple rules, don't worry about terrain, figure out the mechanics. 
that's also a nice touch. They're taking the time to ease you into this. And that's a very important thing to do. Now, um, I played some games with my son, and we just did the, uh, the tutorial, basically. And then when I played with my wife, I'm like, all right, so there's 200 things to choose from. Pick your god. But um, I was familiar enough with the game system where I could help her through. And then she got hooked. We just kept playing the same armies uh, multiple games in a row until we started getting familiar with their powers. And then you can introduce some, some different guys. You can just keep, like, getting to know the game a little bit more and a little bit more. And stuff like this makes it so helpful to get inexperienced players into this wonderful game. So, um, yeah, I've talked about it, the, the draft at the beginning, it's exciting. It's um, it, like in Arcadia Quest, after you're done a mission and everybody's spending their gold on new weapons that they get to use for the next game, that's what this is like when you're picking your heroes. You're basically picking the crazy cool stuff you get to have for that mission. Almost no two games are alike. Um, because it's a back and forth draft. I'm taking him. Oh, you're taking him. I'm not going to let you get this guy. I'm going to draft him. That meta game in itself. Oh, it makes my brain light up. I love that. So I'm saying the rule book was good. I liked it. I didn't come across many things, um, uh, where I had a lot of questions, but I am probably in the minority because a lot of people were complaining about the rule book. But Monolith listened, and they did release an FAQ, a very involved one to all the big questions. I printed it off, and there's some very helpful stuff in there. And another thing about Monolith is they have a, a site called The Overlord. I'll put it up on screen right here. Now, with Conan, they basically have a scenario editor where you can build your own scenarios. They have all the symbols that you can ever need for a scenario. You just drag and drop them onto the map. You need uh, you need some archers on that square. You just grab some archers. You drag them there. Um, it's got a huge community of people like uh, playing each other's missions and play testing them and tweaking them and rating them and reviewing them. This is going to get the same treatment. So if you want a game that is continually supported, and I mean I've got enough content off my Typhon Pledge to last the rest of my life. Doesn't mean I'm not going to be checking out scenarios and playing new ones, or even thinking up my own. Beyond just the skirmish missions, right, there's different setups for every single map. Uh, tells you where to put the um, phallus. There is also campaigns, there's scenarios, there's co-op play, there's solo missions. The list goes on, like, there's really not much this game doesn't have. Um, the choices that the dice system offers, it's refreshing. I like being able to decide if I want to, you know, spend three other numbers, like a, a three, a two, and another two, to change a five into an eight and make it a guaranteed hit. Or do I want to turn three fours into, into a fives by adding one to each of those and risking the reroll? Because if you get a blank, that's lost. It's not the... Most involved decisions, typically it's going to be obvious what you want to do, but it's nice having some choices. It's it's a unique thing. It's not just, oh, I hit, I miss, I block. Um, there's there's like a target, ha uh, an enemy has a target number, which is their shield, and then that's it. Whatever successes you got, that's the damage you're doing. So you're, straight, you're not re-rolling again for saves after the attack, which just adds to the game. So I like that a lot. The game could also be a um, like a long setup because of the choices you have to make. So I would recommend dealing out a certain amount of deities, monsters, gods, and troops, and just drafting from that pool. It's definitely gonna bring that down. Once you know the game like crazy, open it up or just keep say, instead of drafting you know five deities, draft uh, ten of them or draft all the deities and then like you know. Only uh, 10 monsters, 10 heroes, and 5 troop or something. Troop are cool because if they die, your god can bring them back to life. At the end of the turn, you have a chance of getting rid of an Art of War card, and then all your troop, doesn't matter how many are off the board or on the board, they're going to appear in your god's space, and then they get to keep battling. Troops are all just one point each. Um, now, points. I should have touched on this. 
during that recruitment phase, there's a little number on every single uh, unit that's not a troop. The troops are just on cards. They don't have stats. You just remove minis when they get hit, and their stats are on the board. This is a game that I would never turn down, right? On a rating system of one, two, three, or four, one, get that thing with me. I don't ever want to play it. Two, man, if you beg me, I guess I'll play. Three, I like this game a lot. I don't want to play it all the time. Or four, let's play this all the time. I'll never turn the game down. This is a four for me. It hits on all cylinders. The gameplay is uh, 60 to 90 on the, on the box, and that's true for the most part. I don't know if that's going to include the draft at the beginning because, you know, that can go on, but um, 90 minutes is a realistic time frame. And if everything's already set up, if you're just, if you do the draft and then you just play multiple games with the same army, then you can probably be playing in 30 to 45 minutes sometimes, depending on the map and the scenario and the special rules. Uh, another highlight is all this 3D terrain. Yeah, it looks fancy, and I do have some plastic stuff, but the uh, the colored standees looks nicer. Is Guys have talent uh, called Force of Nature, where they can actually rip up these trees and pillars and throw them at other people, and then they're removed from the game. So once the terrain is gone, it's gone. So not only does it look cool, it serves a mechanical purpose. Same with these rocks. you got to have climb or fly to get up there, and then you have... Uh, you don't need line of sight anymore. You uh, you also get an extra to range and an extra dice. Line of sight is something it's worth talking about. You would draw an imaginary line from a center of a terrain to the center of a terrain. And if it crosses a 3D obstacle or any figure, whether it's a big dude like this or a lowly troop, they would block line of sight. So the positioning... In this game, because of that rule, is highly strategic and important. You could just be crossing over a little nub of a corner, but if there's one dude in that, that's considered block. The nice thing about climbing up on rocks is line of sight doesn't matter. You just have to have range. You can see over everybody. So I think I've explained enough to convey my thoughts and my passion and love for this game. If this is your kind of thing... Consider jumping in on the next Kickstarter because you will not be disappointed if this is your kind of game. If you don't like dice checking uh, games with miniatures, you still might find the card play interesting. I would try it before you buy it, but I wouldn't immediately dismiss it. Without a further word of ado, thanks for checking out my review, guys. I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.